And so we're going to kind of talk about some historical facts first. I'm going to give you the three primary facts, I think. And then I have some supporting facts that kind of act like scaffolding for it. And I'm going to show you both in church as well as in secular history how these things actually point to the validity and the accuracy of the New Testament. So fact number one, okay, Jesus of Nazareth was a real historical person. He lived. He was tried by Pontius Pilate. He was then crucified to death. Okay, this is surprisingly not that controversial. Okay, Jesus was real. You can't say, oh, he didn't exist. He was a myth. No, he, he, he really lived. Okay, um, all four Gospels tell us that Pontius Pilate is the one who had him executed. Okay, as you see here in John, as well as the other three Gospels, okay, Pilate sits on the judgment seat. He finally gives in to the pressure, and he hands Jesus over to be executed. Um, we turn to the historical records of Josephus. Josephus was a first century uh, Jewish Roman historian. He was on the Jews. He betrayed them, and then he went to work for the Romans. And then he wrote about the history of the Jews. And when he gets to this time frame, he says very plainly, there was a man named Jesus. Pilate condemned him to be crucified. Um, about 30 years after Josephus wrote his Antiquities, um, another Roman historian by the name of Tacitus, um, he was reflecting back on stuff that happened in the 60s about the time of Nero and the Christian persecution and the Roman fire and all of that. But he's talking about the Christians and he tells you where they came from. In Tacitus, again, no dog in the hunt, he's just a secular Roman historian. He says, Nero inflicted the most awful tortures on a class that was hated for their abominations. Remember, they're pagans looking at Christians, and the Christian practices in their minds are abominations. Um, they were called Christians by the populace, Christus, Latin, um, from whom their name had its origins, suffered the extreme penalty, crucifixion, um, during the reign of Emperor Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. So we see biblical history, church history, and um, secular history. Also, hey, Jesus was a real guy. Pilate had him executed. Okay. Fact number two, all, all. I stress that word all because it's important because we have a bunch of Christians in here and if I asked you all to give me your opinions about the end times, I bet we would have, if we have 100 people, we'll have 300 different opinions. So getting us to agree on stuff can be hard sometimes. So when we all do agree on something, it's important. Um, all of the first followers of Jesus said he rose from the grave bodily. He wasn't a ghost. He was flesh and blood, even under the threat of death, as kind of that video highlighted a little bit. All right. Jesus said himself, look at my hands, look at my feet. It is myself. Touch me. See, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. He's, and he said, give me something to eat. And he ate some fish. Um, and they were willing to die for this belief. Okay. You see Paul. Paul goes to a town. Um, and they don't like what he says. So they take him out and they stone him. Now, whether God does a miracle or what, whatever happened, or Paul gets up and he's bruised, he, uh, Paul's followers go up to him and thinking he's dead. Paul sits right up, goes back into the town that just killed him, packs up his stuff, and he goes to another town the next day. Like, the dude was hardcore. Okay? It's like, I'm going to go to the hospital, take six months off, maybe a year. He was on the road the next day. Why? Because he believed in the resurrected Christ. Um, again, we turn to Josephus, and that's in his same writings of antiquities. He says, those who had become Jesus' disciples, they did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. So here is a secular historian who's saying, yeah, those Christians claim Jesus is alive. He's not saying, I believe it. He's just saying, this is what the Christians believe. Um, then we turn to church history. Clement. Clement was a second generation Christian. Okay, He was a follower of uh, P uh, Paul. Excuse me. Um, in fact, Paul mentions him by name in, in Philippians 4.3. Um, and Paul wrote a letter to the church in Corinth. And about five decades after Paul uh, wrote his um, Clement is writing a letter of his own. He's writing around the same time that John is actually penning um, the book of Revelation. Um, only Clement is not scripture, obviously, but 
he was alive at that time, and he heard the gospel directly from the apostles, okay? He's getting, heard, he's getting taught the gospel directly from the horse's mouth, directly from the apostles themselves. And this is what he wrote. He said, the apostles preached to us, uh, to us, okay, um, the gospel. They were fully assured about by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, and they were established in the word of God. They went forth preaching throughout the countries and the cities. So here is a student of the apostles saying, yeah, they believed in the resurrection of Jesus. Um, here is church history, and here is secular history, again, affirming the same thing. Fact number three, arguably, I think, the most important. Um, even Jesus' strongest followers and critics, um, whether they loved him or they hated him, they all agreed the body was missing from the tomb. They came up with different explanations as to why, but they all agreed it was empty. Okay? Um, the most famous account of this, of course, is in Matthew 28, where the, uh, the, the Roman guards who are guarding the tomb, they go back to the, to the chief priests and they say, uh, the body's gone, what should we do? Um, and the Jewish leadership basically gives them a bribe and say, hey, you're to say that we fell asleep at night and his disciples came and stole the body. Um, and that was the natural explanation that the Jews were giving for this supernatural event. Um, as time went on and the temple got destroyed, um, different Jewish rabbis, as they began to form the Talmud and the later Jewish teachings in the four and 500 ADs, um, Talmudic Jews actually um, put forth a supernatural explanation as to why the body was missing. Um, there was a guy around this time who they did not like. Um, I can't pronounce his name very well, but Okan, uh, yeah, that guy. Um, he was a Roman convert to Judaism and they accused him of witchcraft. In, ne in necromancy. And in the Talmud, which is a Jewish sacred book, um, they basically said that um, that gentleman, this Roman convert to Judaism who betrayed them, that's why they didn't like him afterwards, um, that he raised Jesus using necromancy. So that a sorcerer came along and raised Jesus from the grave. And that Jesus was a sorcerer too, and he was leading Israel astray. And so you had one demon worshiping exorcist necromancer raising Jesus who himself was when actually this does match well with what the Bible said as far as when Jesus did a miracle many of the uh, Pharisees would say oh it's by the power of the devil that you do that or you're possessed by a demon right they're, they're saying that Jesus did his miracles because of demonic power and here you see the same thing okay again they all agree the body's gone whether they're coming up with natural explanations or demonic explanations. No one denies that he did miracles. No one denies that the body was missing. Okay? We're just haggling over the details of the source of it. Um, even the Romans acknowledge that Jesus is gone. I talked about this in a previous conversation, in a previous thing that I did. Um, this is called the Nazareth Inscription. It was found in the 1870s by archaeologists. Um, why would you put a sign in stone in the middle of nowhere town like Nazareth. Oh, wait, yeah, that's where Jesus was from. And essentially what this does is under the penalty of death, it makes grave robbing of bodies illegal. So if you steal a body, it's now a crime punishable by death. Okay, and you ask the question, well, why? Because grave robbers don't steal corpses. They steal gold and valuables, okay? That's why in Egypt, we have a lot of mummies and not a lot of gold, okay? That's why they love King Tut, because grave robbers never found him. He was nobody special. He was one of the most unimportant people. He's like, you know, the Millard Fillmore of pharaohs. He, he means nothing. But he was famous because of what they found with him. Um, and in the case here, why? Why are they making grave robbery of bodies and corpses illegal? And why are we putting that law, that, that plaque, in... Jesus' hometown. Well, that would be very odd. If the Romans believed that someone came and stole Jesus' body, then this law and this plaque issued in 41 AD makes perfect sense. As Dr. Clyde Billings, an archaeologist, put it in one archaeology magazine, he said, quote, The context of the Nazareth inscription, almost certainly issued by Claudius, in response to the story of Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, at the instigation of the Jewish king Herod Agrippa I in 41 AD. So even the Romans 
believed the body was missing, and they wrote a law um, making sure that it wouldn't happen again. Uh, these secondary facts, these are important, right? Because these kind of act as the scaffolding, and you, this is kind of what we're building off of. Um, Roman soldiers are guarding the tomb to prevent theft. There's a giant stone there, there's a seal on it, and failure had a cost, okay? Now, most of you, if you've spent any time in church, you've heard some pastor or some Sunday school teacher tell you that if the Romans failed at their job, the penalty was death, okay? Most of you have heard that before, but do you actually know where that comes from? Have you ever actually looked for the source as to like, okay, yeah, I know that if the Romans fail, okay, yeah, but who said that? Where do, well, I'm going to show you. I'll, t I'll tell you right now. Um, but the instigation for this comes from Pilate, right? Pilate said, take a guard. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. And so they went and made this tomb secure by putting a seal on the, st uh, on the stone and by posting a guard. Um, this is kind of one of those things. It's one of those catch-22 things. If the... <laughs> if the Pharisees had done absolutely nothing, the bare minimum, just leave the rock there, no guards, no seal, no nothing, and leave Jesus' tomb unguarded, then somebody coming and stealing the body is actually plausible. But because they went all out to make sure that no one could get in, they shot themselves in the foot. <laughs> Like, like, do you get it? Like, if they had done nothing, their excuse for why his body is missing works. But because they went all out, <laughs> their excuse falls apart. <laughs> um, the failure of Romans punishable by death, it comes from a Roman historian. He wrote a book called The Histories, makes it simple. Um, I can't pronounce that Roman word. I'm not going to try to and pronounce the Latin, but Fustatarian, whatever. Um, he wrote this in the 140s around the time of the Third Punic War. Um, Hannibal, if you know that, is in the Second Punic War, if you know Hannibal and his elephants and all that. Um, this is the third one right after that. Um, he wrote, when a soldier was found guilty of desertion, theft, negligence, that's the one we care about, um, or other such crime, the tribune, the commander, touched him slightly with a cudgel, a club, upon which all the soldiers of the legion would fall upon him with sticks and stones and generally kill him on the spot. There's about four to 6,000 people in a legion. Um, if somehow he did escape, he was not safe. He could not return to his native country, nor did he have any of his, nor did any of his relatives even dare to give him aid. Um, the extreme severity of the penalty ensured that the night watches of the Roman army were kept scrupulously. You fail, you die. Okay, if you think of it, even in the scripture, you see this, right? When Paul ship, when Paul gets shipwrecked. The commander who had all the guards was going to like kill himself. He's like, no, we're all here. Okay, So you see that even playing out in, in, in the New Testament times too. Um, fact number five. This one is, is, I think, one of the most important for sure. The once fearful followers of Jesus, the guys who were too afraid to go to the cross, the guys who were hiding in the upper room, the guys who were trembling, who ran away when they came to arrest Jesus, suddenly they are bold and willing to die for their faith, okay? After seeing the resurrected Christ, his, his followers go from little ter terrified little kitty cats to lions. Where's that change come from? What would precipitate such a, a, you know, a 180 degree change, right? As Peter said at Pentecost, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are high witnesses of it, okay? Um, Stephen died for this belief. The same people who killed Jesus three years later, they pull Stephen out when he says, Jesus is the Christ. He rose from the grave. You killed him. You stubborn, stiff-necked people. What is wrong with you? The Sanhedrin heard this. They were furious. They gnashed their teeth at Stephen. They all rushed him. They dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him. Meanwhile, witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. More on Saul in a minute. Stephen died for this and he, be, he became the first of millions of martyrs who have given their lives over two millennia for Jesus Christ. 
Um, there was a comedian <laughs> who lived in the second century. His name was Lukian. He was a Greek comedian. Um, he, if you take like uh, Joe Rogan, Bill Maher, and like Howard uh, Stern, and you like kind of mix them all together, that is this guy. He, he loved to make fun of Christians. That was his favorite thing, okay? Um, he, he loved making fun of their naiveness and how gullible they were because these guys are following Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> Love your name. Like, he, he loved to manipulate. And how, so that was his stand-up routine. So this is a guy who is completely against Christians other than making fun of them. And his mockery actually is wonderful proof for what the Christians actually believed. I love the irony of that. Here's a guy who hates Christians and make fun, makes fun of them, but because there's no, he's got no dog in the hunt, as it were, um, it makes his view all the more real and trustworthy because he's showing you this is what Christians actually believed, and I'm making fun of them for it. So this is what he says, right? The Christians would worship a man who introduced this new cult. Remember, he's a pagan. To him, Christians are a cult. Um, who introduced this new cult, and they crucified him for, on that account. And from the moment they, Christians, are converted, they deny the gods of Greece um, in order to worship this crucified sage. <laughs> and then, can you believe this? They actually tried to follow his laws and live like this crucified sage. And all of this, it, it's, it's insane. They believe it all on faith. He's, he's making fun of what the Christians believed. When I, what I'm trying to show you here is, is that there's a consistent thread of what Christians have maintained and held true for 2,000 years. It wasn't invented in the four or 500. Constantine didn't invent it at the Council of Nicaea. Um, there's a constant thread of Christian belief that both the Bible and non-biblical sources affirm. Okay? Uh, Pliny, Pliny the Younger, was a governor of an area in northern Turkey. He's writing a letter to Emperor Trajan. And he's like, I got these Christians. I think they're criminals, but they're not really doing anything criminal-ish. What should I do with them? Um, and he's like, I grabbed two women who were slaves. I tortured them to kind of get information from them. Apparently, they're like deaconesses, whatever that is, in this thing they call church. Um, and this is what he learned after tormenting these two female de deaconesses. Um, he said they, the Christians, um, they were accustomed to meeting together on a fixed day, Sunday, um, before dawn, and to sing a hymn to Christ as if he were a god, worship. And then when this was over, they would leave, but then they'd come back together later and they would have ordinary food. Okay? They would partake in ordinary innocent food, bread, wine, the most common food of that time. You see the most basic elements of church. Although they got up at dawn, most of us don't get up at sunrise to go down to the beach and worship Jesus. Not that we have a beach, but um, those sunrise services, guys. Um, and so, again, here we have secular history affirming what Christians did, what Christians believed. All of these things are happening within a century of Christianity. And by a century, I mean the apostles dying and within a century of all of that. Um, and as we know from several other early church fathers, and honestly, church tradition, we'll be fair and say it's not fully known, but we know for sure that at least four of the apostles and how they died, the rest are kind of tradition. Um, but some of those deaths included crucifixion, beheading. Some were shot with arrows. Some were stabbed, in a, stabbed with a spear, Thomas in India, okay? Um, one was even filleted, okay? Poor, you know, poor Bartholomew. Had a little skin removal process if you don't understand what filleted means. Um, fact number six, I think this is probably the strongest. Um, it's one thing when people who love Jesus become his followers and become hardcore for him, but what about his enemies? What about people who hate him, who hated him while he was alive? And now that they have seen the resurrected Christ, their lives have completely changed. What do you do with that, right? What do you do with James, his, his, his half-brother? What do you do with Paul, Saul, right? The Gospels tell us straight up. Um, his own brothers, James and the, and the other three, they did not believe in him. Okay? Um, on, on two occasions, they even said, Jesus is out of his mind. He's crazy. We think he's a lunatic. Lock him up. Put him in a white jacket. 
And Paul hated Christians, okay? It says, Paul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And then he saw the resurrected Christ. He saw his own brother come back to life. Right? It says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, After being raised, Jesus appeared to 500 eyewitnesses. More on that in a little bit. And at once, and then, he appeared to James. Years later, when Paul is visiting Jerusalem, he says, I saw Peter, and I saw John, and I saw James, the Lord's brother. They are all pillars of the church in Jerusalem. Like, Do you understand what a pillar does? It holds it all up. This guy who used to make fun of him and thought he was a madman not only became his follower, he became the leader of the Jerusalem church. It's a total 180. And as Paul put it himself, right? He said, lastly, Jesus appeared to me as one untimely born. For even though I am the least of the apostles, I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. A complete change of heart. How do they die, right? Secular history and Christian like church history, they both tell us exactly the same thing. Josephus tells us that he was stoned. Um, other historians in, in the church tell us, well, yeah, he was stoned, but actually first they pushed him over the temple top. He fell down several stories, probably broke a few bones, but he, he wasn't actually dead when he hit the bottom. They, they pushed him off the temple top, and then they stoned him to finish him off because he was still apparently only partially dead. Um, and Paul, very famous. Paul is one of those deaths that we can verify because Paul is Paul. He writes you know, half the New Testament. He's really famous. Um, I like the way Tertullian put it. He kind of puts it in poetic terms. He says, Paul won his crown in death like John the Baptist. Okay, see Mark 6 if you need to know how you know, Paul, John died. Um, and then other Jewish or other Christian historians just do a more literal thing. Paul was beheaded. Okay. These men died for their faith. These enemies of Christ who became his followers when they saw his resurrection. And not just his followers. They went from being the greatest enemy of Christianity. Paul goes from being the greatest enemy of Christianity to becoming his greatest champion. What necessitates that change? A resurrected Christ. Nothing else makes sense. <laughs> 